All right, guys, many of you have asked for it, and we're finally going to deliver. Today, we work on a Vortec 2900. So a lot of you have asked, when are you going to do a four or five cylinder? Well, today we reveal our plans to do a Vortec 2900. If you guys don't know, that is the four cylinder version of the Vortec 4200. Specifically, this is a 2900, which is the later larger displacement four cylinder. You can tell that right off the bat because of the aluminum valve cover. GM increased the bore on these engines just a little bit but kept the same stroke. They made like 185 horsepower, something like that. And I think we're gonna find that they're just as capable as the six cylinders are. Now, many of you already know, we're kind of uh, budget-minded people. So, so we uh, obviously were uh, on a bargain hunt when we were searching for this engine. We picked this thing up for like 125 bucks, I think, with the 4L60E. The only issue is it's locked up. So today, we're going to tear this apart and figure out why. Along the way, I'm going to give you my thoughts and comments on differences or uh, comparisons to the six-cylinder. So let's get started. If you guys don't already know, we have had a lot of success with the six-cylinders, like this one that you see here. This is the Vortec 4200, but GM also came out with a four-cylinder and a five-cylinder. Right off the bat, I notice on the exterior of the block, we have the balance shaft tube. GM added these to the four and five cylinder, obviously because they had harmonics issues, but I have already talked to somebody that uh, spins these four cylinders to crazy RPM, and they say that these are for low RPM harmonics and not really uh, a problem if you delete them. Also, I noticed that the exhaust manifold flange is very similar to the six cylinder. The six cylinder just has two cylinders on the back here. So if I buy myself a six cylinder flange, I should be able to just snip off the back portion of it and it should line it right up. You guys probably shouldn't even have to ask. This will be a turbocharged engine. We uh, definitely are not a fans of running these naturally aspirated unless you get the compression up and throw big nasty cams in it. Another difference that I notice is the flex plate looks significantly different. I already know that the rear crank mounting face is different than the six cylinders, hence why you can't take a Vortec 2900 or 3700 flywheel and just bolt it to a six cylinder. Also, I noticed that the harmonic damper is much, much smaller, and that is likely due to uh, this engine having a much shorter crankshaft. I'm sure the balance shafts do a lot to reduce harmonics. If you guys don't know, the six cylinders have issues with vibration around 6600 rpm and that is mainly due to the length of the crankshaft the four cylinder however is a eight inch shorter crankshaft so it should not have the same harmonics issues now as you already know this engine is locked up what i'm hoping to find out is that one of the balance shafts is locked up since we're going to delete those already that would make this a super convenient failure in our particular case, but I don't know if we're gonna get that lucky. So let's get to tearing this thing apart. As with the Vortec 4200, in order to get the intake off, you have to take the alternator off. I also noticed with this alternator that it is a slightly newer design and it looks to be a little bit smaller. So my guess would be it is a it is probably a lower capacity alternator. Not that that really matters, but just interesting. Looks like the engine uh, lifting plate is also a little different. Again, not that that really matters. We normally just take that off anyways. 
<laughs> Looks like the idler bracket here is also a pretty different design. Again, not that that really matters. <laughs> I see that the intake bolts are already loose. So, um, somebody must have been trying to take that off, but the intake looks very similar to the six cylinder intake, obviously with two less cylinders. Much smaller plenum, which is a little weird. Somebody was obviously trying to take this part off and uh, didn't get very far. That's okay, we normally throw those out as well. Looks like a decent design. We'll probably be reusing this. Looks like we have EV6 injectors. That's actually nice because I can get the part number off of them and put them on the wiki. If you guys aren't aware of it already, we have a wiki for the Vortec 4200. If you just search Vortec 4200 wiki on Google, it's like the third link. All right, so first we're gonna pop off the cam cover and see how the valve train looks, see if there's anything to reveal why this engine is not rotating. So let's get this off. Such a cute valve cover. All right, so no broken timing chain. That's a good sign. You'll also see here that we have the four tooth reluctor wheel on the camshaft. That is for the later engines. The uh, six cylinders also got this same uh, reluctor wheel change in 2008. That's uh, something interesting. I believe this is a 2009 engine. So um, just interesting. There's a little bit of camshaft timing chain slop. Not too excessive, but right off the bat, I noticed that the, that the intake cam is moving around slightly, so nothing locked up there. It would be interesting to try and see if the uh, exhaust cam moves at all. But overall, it looks like a six cylinder with two less cylinders. Also, I see that the engine is basically a top dead center. You can uh, easily verify that on these engines by looking at the flats on the back of the camshaft. If they are level, then that means it's at top dead center. So obviously piston number one is all the way at the top. But yeah, overall, I'm not seeing anything here that concerns me, which is a good sign. This is definitely something that we want to be intact. So next, we're going to pop off the back plate of the engine and see if the balance shaft timing chain is intact. And if it's not, then that could be our issue. And if it is, then we're going to remove it and see if the engine now rotates. So, so let's do that. Uh, here's one thing I hate about working around engine cranes. Can't get to the bolts on the back of the engine. Not a huge deal. We'll just uh, work around it. Really don't feel like digging out the engine crane on this 12 degree Fahrenheit day. All right, so these flywheel bolts need to come loose. They are 18 millimeter bolts. All right, so I got the flex plate off. Right off the bat, I noticed that it is a concave design. Obviously they were making room for the balance shaft chain, which you can access by taking this rear plate off of the engine. So that is what we are going to do next. And hopefully we find a broken chain or something stupid like that. So let's get that off. So as you can see, the balance shaft chain is intact. So we are going to take that guy loose and remove it, and hopefully the crankshaft will now rotate over. Maybe wishful thinking, but we can dream. We can dream. So I've never done this before, so I'm just gonna take some guesses here. 
I see there is a tensioner right here. I'm going to take that guy loose. So they put these balance shafts in here because four cylinders are naturally imbalanced. Um, that means they have, uh, I, think, I think, primary imbalances just naturally, just because, you know, there's no avoiding it. Unlike the six cylinders, they are balanced on the primary and secondary, but the uh, six cylinders have issues with uh, tertiary imbalances, meaning the crankshaft likes to do this sort of thing, just because it's so freaking long. Ugh. Yeah, it's one of the reasons that the uh, Cummins motors don't like to rev. They have such a long crankshaft and a gigantic stroke, and so they don't like to rev either. All right, so we got our timing, our balance shaft tensioner loose. Looks to be a very similar design as the timing chain tensioner. Same sort of ratcheting technique where it, as it wears, it just ratchets out like that. Very familiar with how that works. And looks like we got to get the uh, chain guides off of the rest of the uh, deal. And then the chain will come off. Yep, it's one of those days. <laughs> Pro tip, make sure you drain the oil out before you drop the oil pan. I thought that had already been done. Probably should have checked first, but here we are. You know what's worse about working in 12 degree weather? Cleaning up oil in 12 degree weather. <laughs> Okay, so let's flip this thing over. Well, I guess there's coolant in it. <laughs> of course. Oof. Oh, something's draining. Yeah, you're getting covered. Yep, there's coolant in it. Thanks, buddy. Mm hmm. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have spun bearings. Not what I was hoping to find, but that's what you get for such a cheap engine. It's very likely this had a oil starvation issue of some sort. Um, my dad just told me that uh, the previous owner told him that they forgot to put oil in it after an oil change. So that would definitely have, would have caused this failure. You can see the one uh, rod bearing is just completely gone. Um, there's nothing left. And the bearing that is next to it is spun. It looks like it was starting to tear up the main bearings. Yeah, basically most of the parts in this engine are junk. That's okay, it uh, still is going to serve as a excellent mock-up motor. And uh, we will uh, still get our money's worth out of this by selling the transmission. So with that, I'm going to end the video off here and get out of this cold weather. Make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.